Stand with me as we honor the reading of the Word of God. My text is going to be in Luke 15 today, but I felt led to share this with you this morning. God's doing special things at this church. I sense He's doing deep things. I've shared some things, and I'm feeling led to, whether that's now and six months in the future coming, our church is going to become a, a deeply spiritual people. I believe that. I mean this with all due respect. We've been here a year. Thus far, much and most of what I've been teaching and explaining is very, very, very elementary. And many of you are still struggling even with some of the very elementary things that I'm given. Just even asking people to be on time just rub people the wrong way. That's because our culture completely rejects authority. Raising, we're raising our group of teenagers in this nation. We're raising a bunch of narcissists. You give them discipline, it's attack. They have the audacity to be disrespectful to your face, to our youth group, to our pastors, to our teachers. And then they want to go home and tell mommy and daddy that they've been attacked. It's just the narcissist generation that we're being raised in. Everybody refuses authority. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Everybody rejects God, God's authority, reject authority in general, which is part of the reason our nation is 100% crumbling and falling apart. If we're going to turn and die unto self and repent of our sin, it's going to start not in the White House, it's going to start the church house. And let me tell you where that starts. That starts with every man and every woman and every teenager in this room right here and right now for Winfield, Kansas. Because the Bible says in Ephesians 6, verse 10, finally my brethren. This finally my brethren he's given is after he's cleaned up and explained many things. This is after he's given order in the church. This is after he's given order in the family. This is after he's given order in the home. This is after he's told mothers and fathers uh, 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 to submit to each other. He's put the family in order. He's told us to submit to our bosses and our work. He's told us to be submissive to the authority. For those that reject authority, for those that have a problem with authority, your problem is with God. When they came against Moses and Aaron, they came and they humbled themselves before God, and God in numbers essentially told Moses and Aaron, step back. Their problem's with me, Moses and Aaron. Don't take it personal. Their problem's with me. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, in the power of His might. He says to the brethren, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. There's schemes of the devil. There's wiles of the devil. Some of the schemes and the wiles of the devil are to attack us each and all the time. Not some, that's all. The devil wants to come in and disrupt our service today, on Wednesday, next week, Sunday, all the time. And for those who are born again, there's two kingdoms. Everybody in this room, you belong somewhere. Danny said this, took me a minute to catch it, rubbed me wrong the first time, then I understood what he was saying. You're either a possession of God or you are a possession of the devil. If you have a problem with that, take it up with God and his word. There's two kingdoms. You're either saved and born of spirit or you're walking around lost in the darkness. You serve yourself. You serve, you're on the throne of your own heart, which is the most essential satanic thing I can tell you. When Satan fell, he told God, I will. He was on the throne of his own heart. And then we see in the spirit realm, John, there's so much I see in the gospels in the spirit realm. Jesus begins to save and move. Luke chapter 4, we find Jesus preaching in the church house. He's preaching, and all of a sudden, see, we have to learn to see the gospels in the spirit realm. He's preaching, and the religious people got ticked off and angry and wanted to murder him and push him off the cliff of their city. It's in Luke chapter 4. Much of what I struggled and battled with my, before I was 
got saved. I was lost in the darkness. I got saved and born again over 14 years ago. The number one tool in the hand of Satan is a bunch of religious fakes. God has warned us about it. He showed it to us. I say religious fakes because there are people who are not religious fakes. I am not a religious fake. I am religious. It's a belief system. I believe in Jesus Christ. He is my master, my Lord, and my Savior. But the devil we see, look at the attack on Jesus throughout the word. It's in the church, in the church, in the church, in the church, in the church. Traditions, 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 traditions. I've spent a year preaching, teaching, and proclaiming. I'm going to tell you what I've mostly been doing. I have mostly been trying to tear down and unteach so I can give you the word of God correctly. We're not ready to even talk about spiritual gifts yet. We're still talking about being on time and if it's okay to raise your hand. We're in the elementary principles. But I'm trying to help you and point you forward and we are moving forward at a much faster rate than I've seen, than I expected. You need to know this this morning. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Yes, there are spiritual forces on attack here and now. It's funny what the world thinks of as a preacher and a pastor. It's not what I view it at all. You ever see a general warrior? He's got scars all over. He's got his armor all over the place. You can tell this guy's been in battle. Scars ripped up, got his sword and his shield. That's the way I view myself in the spirit realm. Branson, are you saying that you're a warrior in a spiritual combat? That's exactly what I'm saying. You need to know that we are in a wrestle and in a fight. You need to know that the Bible teaches that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So if someone has a spirit of rebellion, they have a spirit of witchcraft. I remember when I took over in the youth department for a year and a half before I left, something had happened. I was one of the ordained pastors. He had been with the associate for years in my other church. I knew that it was for a short time and place. I stepped into the youth group. About week five or six, I had to go on the war path. After that, didn't have any more problems for a year, did we, John? Here's what happens in our culture today. 50 years ago, kids disrespectful and gets in trouble. Parents and teacher talk to the kids. Here's what happens today. Kids disrespectful, blatantly arrogant, rebellious, disrespectful, blatantly in your face on purpose, staring you down with knives. See, it didn't happen 50 years ago. See, they'd have gotten their butt whipped. Now the arrogant, disrespectful kid gets in trouble, goes home, go tells mommy and daddy, let's go back and talk to the youth pastor. Let's go back and talk to the teacher. And they want to stare at him. We feel attacked. It's the attitude of our culture. I'm using this as a small example. This is the attitude of our culture. You think I'm just calling out teenagers? No, that's the mom and dad's. Going to a movie theater, I ask you to be quiet, turn off your phone. What do you do when you go to a movie? I don't know about you, I don't want to get up during the movie. I try and go to the bathroom before. And then when I find a place in the movie that I think is going to be a slow part, I sprint. And I try and be really quiet and not interrupt anybody. Ask people that same question in the church house. People are going to be offended and leave. If you're offended today and leave, that's none of my business. In Luke chapter 15, which is where our text is today, 
Jesus gave three parables with one point. Three parables with one point. What's a parable? I'm glad you asked. A parable is a story that Jesus gave a story that your natural mind would understand something spiritual. Jesus is trying to convey and show us spiritual truth, things that are in the spirit world that are true and how it happens, but he's going to give you a natural story to help you understand it. In Luke chapter 15, I'm going to read you the first two stories, then I'm going to preach from the third parable. Luke 15, the Bible says, this is important for the rest of these three. These first two verses are important for the three parables that were given. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. So you have these tax collectors and, and the sinners, and we see the Pharisees. you got like the tax collectors and sinners, and then you got the Pharisees. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him and hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So you have these people that are self-righteous, that know scripture, that go to church weekly, daily, much more often than we do. And they reject Jesus Christ as Lord to their face because they wanted to exalt themselves, which was true 2,000 years ago, which is true right here today in 2021 in Winfield, Kansas. It's the number one tool of the hand of Satan. It's true then. It's true now. Sometimes it can also apply to people who have been saved and born again and just become steeped in traditions. If you study the Bible, very few times does the Bible give traditions in a positive light. So here we see all these sinners and then the scribes and the Pharisees. In verse 2, scribes and the Pharisees, they complained. Of course they did. Of course they did. There's always complainers in the church. There's always critics in the church. Jesus was greatly, greatly criticized. This man received sinners and eats with them. So he spoke a parable to them saying, What man of you having a hundred sheep? If he loses one of them, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. See, there's three parables, three stories. All three of them have one point. What was lost is found. Verse 5, and when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes, he calls together his friends and neighbors saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, remember, spiritual truth, natural story, spiritual truth, likewise, I say to you likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. We see the joy of somebody getting saved. One of the things that the self-righteous, even those who have been in church for a long time, that have become steeped in the traditions, we view somebody as say, getting saved that they're just over that. I have never felt such an attack from keeping and preaching the gospel. Listen, one of my main points of today's sermon is we are ambassadors on a rescue mission. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. If you think that you're overly too spiritual for that, I promise you this, you're way more spiritual in your mind than you think you are. I have so many people that want to argue, that want to talk. They have all these arguments, all these things they want to talk about. You'll notice about people who are criticizers and complainers. You'll notice something about them. There's no fruit in their life. Some of you sharply accuse me while I'm standing here right now. Some of you have sharply accused me in your hearts right now. Some of you do it when you go home. You think things ought to be done a certain and a different way. And there's no fruit in your life. Nobody's been saved as a result of your ministry. But you want to instruct the pastor how we ought to run a church. My pastor, Joplin, said on the book, The War Within, the evidence of God upon any ministry is the presence of new life. You'll find often those who are most critical of the preacher are those who haven't helped win a soul to the Lord in their whole lives. They would come and argue about us how we ought to run service. 
Furthermore, the lack of birth and the supposed ministry of those criticizers testifies for all to see that God has disapproved and rejected their self-professed ministry to the saints. New life has always been the standard for God. You're wondering where you're going to sit down in just another minute. Verse 8, or what woman having 10 silver coins? Back then it was uh, in their culture, a woman would get 10 silver coins. It was a headpiece or a necklace. It was uh, showing that she was married. She lost one of those. It would be embarrassing. For what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls for her friends and rejoices together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. I've, I've seen it and I've felt it in here. I've seen it at times. Some people get excited when one person gets saved. Some of you, you could care less. The Bible says the angels rejoice. If you're the only one rejoicing, stand and do it. Be a tree that's planted by the rivers of water. Father, in Jesus' name, finish what you've started. Move in this place. We need your zeal. We need your flames. We need your fire. We need your truth. We need your love. We need your power and your presence. Have your way. Anoint ears and hearts. Carry me and hold me. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I have no degrees. I'm a scallywag that you saved and changed, and you called me and commanded me to preach the word. Here I am, Lord. Anoint me. Carry me. Do spiritual deep things in this place. Save the lost. If this is our last service on this side of heaven, if you're coming back tonight, save souls in this room. Revive your church. I pray if there's sin in the hearts of me or any of those who are saved and born again, we would repent and run to you. We need you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, very well-known scripture. I believe in all the 12 or 13 years I've been preaching, I've preached this text one time. If you've been in church any length of time, or even if you haven't, many have heard of this story of the prodigal son. I'm asking you to give your ears special attention to the word this morning. Pray that God would give us a fresh illumination, a fresh touch. Here we see the third story that Jesus is giving to those self-righteous people that were angry and upset. Then he said, verse 11, third story, three parables, one point. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. In this culture, we'll see here in a little bit, the, there's an older son and a younger son. The older son would have had two-thirds, would have had two-thirds of the portion. The younger son would have had one-third of the portion. The disrespect and the arrogance and the audacity of this man to ask his father before he's dead to give him his third, his portion of the inheritance was completely disrespectful to his father. His father must have been crushed. He essentially said, I wish you were dead. I want nothing to do with you, but I want the blessing. Many believe in this culture, many believe the Father exists. They want his blessing without his lordship. They want God's blessings. They say to God, give me, Father, give me. This is a great picture of our culture. People believe in God, they say, Father, give me. They want something. They want God's blessing. They want God to give them. He's their sky and the he's their, their their guy in the sky, their miracle Santa Claus. Give me, give me, give me while I do what I want, while I'm my Lord, while I reject your presence and I don't want you, I still want to walk in sin and darkness. Give me and bless me. I can't tell you how many times I see. I was watching it. I don't know, remember what it was recently. Some of the NFL players, oh, 
We're going to give God glory. And then we're going to go use the F word on the sideline. Oh, God, give us a victory today so we can go and curse with our mouths and leave and go live the life of wickedness and darkness. We can go get drunk and high. We can go have sex with multiple partners and party it up. Oh, God, bless us. People think that these, we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We see them as self-righteous, but we don't see sinners. You know, people who don't go to church this morning, like, oh, I don't have to go to church. Yeah, you're by definition self-righteous. If you're not saved in here this morning, you are self-righteous. You don't see that you need Christ. You are by definition self-righteous. This is our culture. This is what this man wanted. He didn't want the Father. He didn't want his presence. Give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So the Father divided them, his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. What do you mean prodigal living? Well, he was a scallywag. He went out to the casino and blew it. He went and got high, drunk, he went and got with harlots. He went and lived it up and gave his flesh all that he wanted. That's what he did. Not many days after. See, he went on this journey. This is what he wanted to do. He wanted to satisfy his flesh. But when he had spent all. Somebody say all. See, he spent all. Let me tell you something about this world. I've lived in this world. I come from the darkness. I've lived in the evil. I've lived in the darkness. If you're lost and you've been saved, then so have you, which is everybody in this entire room. You may not be saved, but we all come from the darkness. When he had spent all, darkness, rejecting Christ as Lord, will cost you everything. When he had spent all, Huh. One of the things I want to tell this culture, this generation, our college, our high school, our adults, let me tell you something. Sin is fun for a season, and the Bible teaches us so. Hebrews eleven twenty five. listen to Moses, about Moses, Hebrews eleven twenty four and 25. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He's about 40 years old. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Wait a minute, the Bible just says it's pleasurable? Sin's fun for a season? Is that where we get that phrase from? Yes, it is. Sin is fun for a season. Pleasures of sin. Listen, it's passing. The passing pleasures of sin. Because, see, back to our text, let me tell you something where darkness will leave you. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. For those of you that reject Christ as Lord, everybody in here, for those of you that live and walk in darkness, it will cost you everything. And that fun season runs out. And let me tell you something. If you're not living for Christ, there's a famine in the land, and it's coming. There is a price to pay. Sin will cost you. Oftentimes, I, I used to preach this. John, you've heard me say this many times in our other youth group from our other church. It's like the dark, evil man that wants to steal, kill, and destroy and do wicked things. To a teenager, to a child, they leave the popcorn trail. Mommy and daddy and the people that love the person try and warn them, don't do this, don't do this. It will cost you. It will harm you. They pick it up and they eat it and go, huh, tastes good. Nothing happened to me. And they keep going down this trail, down these dark stairs. And their arrogance and rebellion, they stop and go, huh, they said it was going to harm me. Everything's fine. And then they get to this place where the stairs and the spiral staircase is dark and dim. They're in this dark place. And that pleasurable fun season has run out. And the devil's calling and he's coming. And he'll take everything from you. 
and you're in a famine and all of a sudden you look up and you're much farther than you wanted to go. Sin will take you farther and it will cost you more than you ever know. God is not trying to keep anybody from a good time. You know, God wants to bless us. You know, I don't say that enough. We have these large pendulums in the church. We're afraid to say that. I'm not, I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. I am saying this, though. God wants to bless us. You think it's his will that you be sick and poor? You, you think anybody's going to be sick and poor in heaven? No, he wants to bless us. The Bible says in verse 15 that he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Pigs in this day and culture were an absolute abhorrence to the Jews. This is how bad this guy's doing. He joined himself to a citizen of that country, sent him to his fields to feed swine and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. He's at a bad place right now. The pigs were doing better than he was. If you're living in sin this morning, God wants to save you and heal you and deliver you. If you're having sex outside of marriage, stop it. If you're getting drunk, stop it. If you're prideful or if you're gossiping, stop it. If you lie, little white lies, stop it. If you're lying on your taxes, stop it. If you're not being faithful to God like you should be, stop it. To him who knows the right thing and does not do it to him, it is sin. Oftentimes we talk about these sins, we talk about sorcery, rebellion, adultery, witchcraft, drunkenness. Let me tell you something. What's equally sin? Pride and arrogance. Self-exaltation. Being wise in your own estimation. Being unteachable. Rejecting authority. Many in the church houses of America today view themselves as the highest level of spiritual authority in their lives. There's people in this room. You literally see yourself as the highest level of authority, spiritually speaking, in your life. You know, it's funny. We can see that this man lived in prodigal living. We can see the darkness incredibly in our culture today and now people even want to argue with me about what sin and darkness is we have a culture in the church of christians getting drunk we have a culture that call themselves christians that aren't even faithful barely even to the house of god we have a culture of people i've been told this recently and in the past, we have a culture of people that want to argue with this ex-druggie that getting high and smoking marijuana is not sin. Unbelievable, isn't it? Paul decided to write to a young Titus a young man leading the church. Paul had some things he wanted to say to Titus. Titus chapter 1, verse 13. This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. This is Paul speaking to a young pastor showing him how to do it. Chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Greek word for soberly from Strong's, sozo, 
It's talking about to save the mind. It's an adverb signifying responsibility, sensibility, prudence. It means to be in self-control and in full possession of your mind intellectually and emotionally. If you are high on marijuana, you are not in full possession of your mind intellectually and emotionally. I have smoked pot all day, every day, for almost nine years. I mean this, if, you know, Paul says I'm going to boast foolishly. If I was to foolishly boast arrogantly, like a fool, I would say that I've probably smoked more pot than all of you combined times ten all the time. Isn't that foolish and stupid to say? Well, that was Branson Sears. Everybody in here, sit up and pay attention and look at me. Thank you. I didn't seek the face of God and fast and die unto self for a single person in this place to be hunched over staring at the floor. Please pay attention. Back to my text. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. I have done lots of drugs, and marijuana, 100%, is a gateway drug. Well, they're about to maybe make it legal in this. I don't care that it's legal. Getting drunk is legal. <laughs> the foolishness. God gave me instructions, though. I'll further go. Chapter 2, verse 15. Speak these things... Exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Yes, sir, my master. Verse chapter 3 and verse 9 of Titus. But avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and striving about the law for they're unprofitable and useless. Reject, reject, reject a divisive man or woman, reject a divisive man or reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition. John, give him one or two admonitions about this foolishness, then reject him. Knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. That's pretty clear. That's good preaching right there. If you want to talk to me about some of those foolish elementary things, take that trash somewhere else. The wickedness of this evil generation that we live in. Okay, let's get to the good stuff now. Back to Luke 15, verse 17. So here he is in the swine. Nobody gave him anything. He's in famine. He's in wickedness. He's in darkness. He wants the Father's blessing. He wants to put scripture on Facebook. He wants to be just encouraging and loving while he's out living and walking in darkness. He wants all the blessings of God while he lives and walks in lawlessness, sin. And here he is spent in the darkness, empty and lost. It's a wicked place to be. I want to say this. And I have rebuked sin sharply, and I am unapologetic about it. I am thankful that when people are in that state, I am thankful that I know I was in that state. I'm thankful that God came and saved me and pulled me from it. I am thankful that God, I was self-righteous, I was arrogant, I was full of hypocrisy. I was living and walking in darkness, and I knew it was wrong. I knew it was sin. I am thankful that God loved me. Branson, why do you preach so hard against sin? Look right here, I'll tell you why. Because God loves you. And sin will destroy you. I was in the Philippines. Next Sunday, Pastor Ephraim Camacho is going to be here. Did I tell you that, Christine? Ephraim's going to be here. He's staying at our house. He's going to be here Thursday. We're going to get together. We're all going to have a feast for him. Ephraim Camacho, my friend, going to be our soon-to-be partner from the Philippines. He's going to be here next week. He's going to lay out and give you all their ministry. He's, going to, he's even going to preach for us. I 
I can't remember why I started telling that story. What was I saying before that, John? Do you remember? Uh, what? Wait, what'd you say? Yes, thank you, John. That was good. <laughs> Our associate pastor's paying attention. I was at a camp a few years ago. Uh, Josiah, I think you, you guys might have both been there. Josiah, I don't remember if it was the year you were there. I was in the Philippines, and normally God doesn't speak to me this way. I've heard of other people happen. I normally really don't have, like, visions and dreams, especially, like, dreams. Now, I do believe that that is biblical. If you have a problem with dreams, you're going to have to take that up with God. If you look in the early parts of Luke, there's, like, dreams mentioned over and over and over and over and over. It's funny about dreams. The Bible doesn't give us this uh, structure and teaching on how it works. We just know that God uses it, and it's there. We know that. So I was in the Philippines, one of the, I think maybe the only time in my life for me. I've heard of other people living and walking in dreams. The Bible says, uh, in another place, instruction and order the prophets are subject to the prophets. So whenever I listen to those things, I, I wait. You know, if I have a check in my spirit or if I think it's for the Lord, I wait and pray about it. We always want to have the word of God as our foundation. But listen, my whole point is this. God uses dreams. Amen, Branson. I'm in the Philippines and I woke up. I'd been preaching at this camp all week and I had a dream in the Philippines. In my dream, I, I looked down and we were in the sanctuary and there was kids uh, all over the place. We weren't in service. It was a fun time in the afternoon and people all over. A lion came out of the woods and was ravaging and just tearing them up. They're screaming and yelling, trying to help their friends and this lion's ravaging them. I see them and I start and I remember thinking to myself, I'm about to run and sprint and help and do all that I can to fight this lion and help save these kids. And in my heart, I was about to run to them, and I can still remember it. In my heart, I said to myself, what am I going to do? It's a lion. And I started to run towards it, and then I woke up. God showed me the meaning of that dream as I continued to preach that camp. The devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Yes, spiritually speaking, right here and right now. How does the lion kill and destroy us? Through sin. Some of you in here right now, under the sound of my voice, you're ravaged, you're hurt, you're fallen apart. You're ravaged like this man in famine. You're broken, you're hurt, and you're lost. The lion has ravaged you through sin. This is why God hates sin. Because he loves you. <laughs> Look at me. Jesus loves you. Jesus is full of grace and mercy. Jesus says in John chapter 1 verse 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that good? Isn't that happy? See, we don't get to the happy news till we deal with the negative news. The problem with the churches today, nobody's dealing with the negative news. And therefore, people are in their state and their lost darkness being patted on the back by the church while they're headed to a devil's hell. That's mean. That's, that, that's mean. That's evil. I feel God in this place. Verse 17. The Bible says, but when he came to himself. Would you pull up John chapter 6, 44 for me, Myra? John chapter 6, verse 44. So listen, he's in this terrible state. He's there. The pigs are doing better than he is. In my main text, I said, but when he came to himself. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? We gotta make that, Matt, we gotta make that computer last two more weeks. We're getting that new one. So listen, it, just leave that there for a minute, moment, Myra. It says, but when he came to himself, I wrote a note in my Bible. This was an action of the Holy Ghost. See, he wasn't saved yet, but listen, there's times where the Holy Ghost steps in. He came to himself. 
See, no one can come to me, Jesus said. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up in the last day. You can go back to our text. It says he can't come unless the Father draws him. See, he came to himself, John. I remember that morning, October 21st, 2007, something started happening. Things entered my mind that brought me to that church that day. This is an action of the Holy Ghost. We can't be afraid to talk about the Holy Ghost. If you're Baptist or free will Baptist, or if you have a background, a Christian church, and you were never raised the other way, by the way, I wouldn't raise the other way either. By the way, there's far pendulums. I'm not Pentecostal. I'm not Baptist. I am a born-again Christian following Jesus. And I have got to look at this word. We cannot hide, reject, and not talk about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity. He is God. He is Lord. And I have his spirit. I am possessed right now with the spirit of God. What do you think made me so happy? What do you think I don't have to drink and do drugs anymore? I used to think it was a matter of trying harder. It's not. It's a matter of dying, being saved and born again. But when he came to himself, Jamie, aren't you thankful when you came to yourself? John, aren't you thankful when you came to yourself? Verse 18, what's he say? Listen, listen right here, pay attention. Three words with me, verse 18, say it with me. I will arise. Oh my goodness. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. We can see his attitudes changed, hadn't it? He went from pride and arrogance to humbling himself. Some of your problem in here, definitely to the lost, and maybe and probably to some of those who are born again, You're prideful and arrogant and you refuse to humble yourself. I'm thankful that God came and saved me and pulled me out of the darkness. John, I'm thankful in 2017. I'm thankful when they made a change at our church and I felt betrayed and stabbed in the back. I was so deceived. I'm thankful that God stepped in my life, in Branson Sears' life in 2017, been saved for 10 years. I'm thankful that God came down, grind me to powder, and humbled me. I'm so thankful for it. How you respond is everything. If you're waiting on God, continue to wait, and then wait a little bit longer. Branson, you can't just stay here. It's 2018, it's 2019 now. There's no vision. There's no calling. Branson, you can't just stay here. You need to go do this. You need to go do that. Mm -mm. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No. Why? Because God didn't tell me to move. He told me one word. Wait. 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 No vision. No future. It looks like the ministry's closing. I'm not going to be the youth pastor anymore. We knew that was a thing. I can tell God moving me out. Wait. Wait, God steps in in August 2020. I finally got to this place in that past year or so where I said, God, I'm happy. And if my ministry's over, I love you and you're enough for me. 2020, God steps down and says, you're moving to Winfield, Kansas. It's starting a church. I will arise and go to my father. Say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose. Notice he didn't just say it in his heart. He actually did it. Well, I can just say it in my heart and not go lay on my face before God. Even though Jesus says, come to me, all who are, here, who are weary and heavy laden, even though they had the altar, even though that our actions prove what we're actually doing, you, know, you can think something and not do it. He, he thought I'm going to rise and go. Well, what did he do? And he, verse 20, and he arose. You know, the Bible says that faith without works is dead. That's what the Bible teaches. A faith that will save you, listen, a faith that will save you will change you. 
Young man in the back, sit up and pay attention. Put your head up and look at me, please. And he arose, verse 20, and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He was way off, but the father happened to see him. You know, I felt that day, October 21st, 2007, I felt so far from God. Oftentimes, one of the things the devil keeps us from actually repenting and turn to God is that you're so far off, you've gone so far down the dark trail, you'll never get back. But if you'll turn and make the choice, I am going to turn, I am going to arise, I will go to my Father. He will see you because He's looking for you. Amen. The Father saw Him a great way off and had compassion and ran and fell on His neck and kissed Him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. There's a second part that he was about to say. Remember, he already said what he was going to say. He's about to say, make me like one of your hired servants. But the father, Steve, interrupts him. And the son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, no longer worthy to be called your son. Verse 22, everybody listen to me right now. But the father said, oh, you didn't get it. But the father said, <laughs> I'm thankful that we know this morning, Kelly, I'm thankful we know what the father said. Brady, I'm thankful that we know what the Father said. John, but the Father said. Somebody ought to be running laps, but that's all right, I, I guess. But the Father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, and they bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be married. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. That's a good story, isn't it? Luke 19.10, our main theme here. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came for the sheep. The woman found the coin. The father found his son, and there's rejoicing. We're about to see here, there's music and dancing. Sorry, traditional religious people, if you don't like music and dancing, take it up with God. I like music and dancing. By the way, I have a confession to make. Sometimes me and my kids turn up, everybody dance now, and crank it and dance and get jiggy with it in my kitchen. <laughs> That's your pastor. If you don't like that, congratulations. You're more spiritual than me. Take it. This is, this is what we are. This is what the church has lost. We're a rescue mission. We're ambassadors on a rescue mission. You know the Bible says, that's people I look for in ministry, in anything, doing anything. The Bible says in Proverbs 11.30, he who is wise wins souls. That's where we get the phrase soul winners. But look this way. I already read Pastor Joplin's book earlier. Listen, he who is wise wins souls. You know, some churches are growing, have a great congregation, and no one ever gets saved. I was a part of a church as a teenager. There's four or 500 people there. In my five, three, four or five years, I, to my knowledge, never saw a single soul get saved. Welcome to the Church of America. Listen to me. If you're here or if you go somewhere else, follow the soul winners. He who wins souls is wise. You want to know that God's blessing and wisdom and anointings on a church? Look for a church where people are saved. I'm not talking about emotional decisions. I'm talking about people being born again. I'm talking about people like Danielle. Danielle came in here on a Sunday night. I can still remember. You don't mind if I share this, do you? Okay, I was going to anyway. I'm just joking. Love you, sister. Love you. 
Danielle came in here on a Sunday night back when we were renting. I can still see her face. I went and shook up her hand, and I was thinking, this person's got walls and don't want to shake the preacher's hand. Well, sometimes I might just be overly weird and shake your hand anyway. Be like, hey, how you doing? I'm trying to freak you out. I'm just joking. I'm sorry. It wasn't that funny. I could still remember her face. I don't remember what point in the service, but I know this. At one point in the service, she died and was born again and has been saved, and she has been faithfully serving God ever since then. We have many stories like that. He who is wise wins souls. If you don't go here, wherever you go, go to a church where souls are being saved. We are ambassadors on a rescue mission, not just me. You think I'm in ministry? You're in ministry. My job is to prepare you for when we go out. Today, you need to arise and go. Be the hands and the feet of Jesus. You can't do it in your flesh, in your thoughts, in your mind. You have to walk intimately and be filled with the Spirit. Yes, yes, be filled with the Spirit. Do not quench the Spirit. It's the ghost. It's the Spirit that leads, that guides, that shows, that saves. Matt, will you come help me finish? The story was awesome in the Bible. It should be over with, but it's not. Because he's not just talking to a group of sinners. He's talking to a bunch of Pharisees. Wait a minute, aren't they all sinners? Yes, Luke chapter 5, verse 32. Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Is Jesus saying that those Pharisees are righteous? No, that's not what he's saying. Here's what Jesus is saying. There's a bunch of sinners in this room. Some are Pharisees. Some are wicked people that live in the darkness and they know it. All of them are wicked and living in the darkness. But the group of Pharisees saw themselves as righteous. See, they were self-righteous. They saw their righteousness outside of Christ. They saw it through their dead traditions and their dead works. That's why we have to be careful about traditions. We do. I, I almost wore my Travis Kelsey jersey this morning. I just wore a red shirt anyways. We have to be careful about our traditions. You, you, well, I believe in dressing up and that you should do this for the house of God. Okay, that's all great and dandy, but that's not written in the Bible. So don't teach me doctrines of men as commandments of the Bible. Period. That's what the Pharisees were guilty of. Teaching their traditions and what they wanted as the commandments of God. The only thing the Bible talks about with clothing is modesty. That's good preaching. See, unfortunately, there's another part of this story. Verse 25, now the older son was in the field. And he came and drew near to the house and he heard music and dancing. Amen. So he called one of the servants and asked, yeah, I like music and dancing. By the way, we're not going to have Wednesday night service. You know Thanksgiving's in a couple weeks. It's on a Thursday. Somebody shake your head and say yes. Thank you. That Wednesday night before, we're not having service. We're not going to have church. The Tuesday night before, we are. That Tuesday night, we're having church. Is Jeannie teaching today, Butch? She is. Okay. Where's Sarah's in here? Sarah's right there. I didn't say anything to anybody yet. This is my announcement during my sermon. That Tuesday night, we're going to have a service. It's going to start at 7. We'll have nursery. We're not going to have children's church or teens. We're going to have a service, Matt. You guys are going to play two or three songs. I'm going to do a short service. We're going to get out at like 7.45. And then we're all going to go to the fellowship hall. And Sarah and Donna and Jeannie, all the ladies, are going to have a whole bunch of pies and food. We're all going to fellowship. Now, don't tell me you don't want to fellowship because sometimes I can't leave because you won't leave. Now, that's good, though, because you're talking. We're going to fellowship and have fun on that Tuesday night. We're going to have a special service. Maybe we ought to have music and dancing. I have good news. God is a God of fun. He is a God of fun. And heaven's going to be a lot of fun. Verse 26, so when he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant, this is eye-opening. The older brother was out in the field working, 
and didn't know what the father's business was, a servant had to come and tell him. Isn't that eye-opening? Isn't that scary? See, he's talking about those religious self-righteous leaders here. They're out in the field working, but they don't know the father's business. This is much of the church of America. They're out in the field working apart from the father and don't know nothing about the father's business. And he said to him, your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf, but he was angry. I always plan on getting done at 10 till and I never do. It says he was angry. First time recorded the word anger is in Genesis. Cain's about to kill Abel. Genesis 4, 6. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Some of you in here, your countenance tells on you. Your countenance says, I'm religious, I'm self-righteous. Your countenance says, I accuse you, pastor. Your countenance says, I live and walk in sin. Why is your countenance fallen? This is what God says. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And it's desirous for you. But you should rule over it. Cain was angry. Older brother, he's angry. Why? His brother got saved. Father's happy. God's moving. Some people get angry when God moves. Some people get angry when people raise a hand. Some people get angry when there's young girls over here waving their banners. I'm going to tell you why. Your anger is derived from your pride and your arrogance and your unwilling to worship God and it shines a bright light on your arrogance and your unwillingness and you grow angry. The older brother's angry and would not go in. Therefore, the father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered said to his father, Lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I may, might make merry with my friends. Let me tell you what he was saying to God. Let me tell you what he's saying to the father. Some of you in here are probably saying to God, I've been guilty of this. I have. They're saying, God, you owe me. I've been faithful all these years. God, you owe me something. But as soon as the son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. See, he's not excited at all. Somebody got saved, he don't care. Teach us more doctrine. Somebody got saved, oh. He said to him, son, you're always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right. Somebody say right. It was right that we should make merry. Music and dancing. It was right that we were having music and dancing. That was right. Pow. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. Somebody got saved. Somebody got born again. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. He ended that story dealing with the older brother. Sometimes I believe the older brother, in this case we know it was the self-righteous Pharisees. I also believe that sometimes Christians over the years we can grow and our, our hearts can become hardened. And that picture of the older brother can be us. Three parables, one point. He'll come and find you if you're a lost sheep. The woman looking for that lost coin she did whatever it took to find it. God will, take, do, God will do whatever it takes to find you. And the son who walked away and didn't want the presence of the father, when the son arose and came back, the father was waiting and looking for him and had compassion on him. 
If you're in here today and you're not saved and born again, everybody in this room, stand with me right now, please. If you're not saved and you're not born again this morning, the Father sees you, He loves you, He has compassion on you, and He says, come. For those of you who are saved and born again, He says, come. <laughs> Whatever the need is this morning, Whatever the need is, these altars are open. Won't you come?